Now we'll talk about life in the Gulf. Life in the Gulf is diverse because there are many different ecosystems and habitats that support many kinds of organisms and species. Even in the deepest and darkest regions of the Gulf, there is life. Chemosynthetic communities are found deep in the Gulf. These form near cold seeps where hydrogen sulfide, methane, and other hydrocarbon-rich fluids seep from the Gulf's floor, enabling organisms there to use these resources in chemical reactions that produce energy. There are other communities deep in the Gulf waters too, consisting mostly of bacteria and tiny benthic organisms. Macroinvertebrates there abound, such as crabs, mollusks, shrimp, and jellyfish. Currents move throughout the Gulf, forming big loops. These currents help create areas where water from the bottom rises to the surface. When water rises this way, it's called upwelling, and it mixes nutrients in the water. The increase in nutrients in surface waters enables primary producers, such as phytoplankton, to grow and become food for zooplankton and filter feeders, such as the giant whale shark, a bride's whale. The plankton allows for growth of smaller filter feeders as well, such as menhaden, which travel the gulf in large schools. These fish become prey for larger pelagic fish, such as tuna and mackerel. There are also frequent rapid increases in phytoplankton called algae blooms. Sometimes the species of plankton involved have toxic characteristics. This is then called a toxic algae bloom or a harmful algae bloom. These are sometimes also called red tides because of a red or brownish color caused by some phytoplankton species. The blooms can kill fish and marine mammals and cause health problems for people exposed to the water or when the blooms reach close to shore. On the coral reefs, there's an abundance of invertebrate species that use the hard surface as a place of attachment. This life attracts small fish, which attract larger predators such as groupers, amberjack, and snappers. The beach zone, oil and gas platforms, deep canyons, and more all add to the diversity of habitats for gulf life. Species normally associated with land are also found here. There are turtles and birds using special adaptations for a life at sea, such as the turtle's flippers and the seabird's tear glands that allow them to secrete excess salts. Of the Gulf's many ecosystems, coral reefs stand out as the most biologically diverse, productive, and complex of all. They are economically important as sources of food and medicinal products, and they provide shoreline protection in some places. They're also a great source of natural beauty and provide significant tourism opportunity. However, degradation and loss of this ecologically and economically valuable habitat is a worldwide concern. Coral reefs are among the most endangered marine ecosystems on Earth. Coral reefs are tropical, shallow water ecosystems. There are only two true coral reefs in the northern Gulf of Mexico. These lie about 100 miles off Texas within the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. Texas coral reefs are the northernmost coral reefs in the Gulf of Mexico. Fortunately, they're some of the healthiest coral reefs in the entire Western Hemisphere. Flower Garden Bank Sanctuary received its name from the colorful collection of reefs that resemble a flower garden when viewed from the surface. They sit atop salt domes. These rise up from the seafloor. The reefs are about 60 to 400 feet below the surface. Now the sanctuary is visited by a wide array of aquatic life, including numerous species of rays and sharks, sea turtles and marine mammals, and over 23 kinds of coral and approximately 400 species of reef invertebrates inhabit the banks. This includes at least 27 species of sponges, 20 species of polychaetes, 
162 species of mollusks, and 36 species of echinoderms. Over 280 fish species thrive in the reefs, including snapper, hogfish, groupers, puffers, and angelfish. Whale sharks visit in the summer, and in winter, you can see schools of large hammerhead sharks and rays. There's even a resident population of over 70 manta rays at the sanctuary that are regularly seen there by visitors. Artificial reef ecosystems dot the Gulf. Vast deposits of oil and gas rest under the Gulf's water. Extracting petroleum products is the largest economic industry in the Gulf today, supplying 25% of gas and 10% of the oil produced in the United States. To get these natural resources, there are about 4,000 oil and gas platforms in coastal and offshore Gulf waters. While there are instances where trash or pollution from gas and oil drilling rigs and production platforms have caused some pollution, the platforms add to Gulf productivity by creating small but ecologically diverse habitats where none would exist otherwise. The Gulf of Mexico contains thousands of species of animals, algae, and other life that need hard surfaces to cling to in order to complete their life cycles. Since the Gulf has very little naturally occurring reef or hard structure habitat, these man-made structures such as the oil and gas platforms give invertebrates such as corals, sponges, polychaetes, mollusks, echinoderms, and other animals the hard surface they need to grow and survive. Energy from the organisms that accumulate there over time then flows up the food chain as primary producers feed consumers and predators feed on the prey. New habitat is then created for larger predator species such as snapper, grouper, mackerel, shark, and other fish. Even sea turtles benefit from the new feeding opportunities. This habitat in turn provides fishing and diving opportunities for people. You may wonder, what happens to these platforms when they get old? Well, many continue to enhance the Gulf's productivity. At the end of a platform's functional life, some are cleaned and toppled into the water in place. Others may be cut into large pieces and transported to another spot in the Gulf where they're sunk to the bottom. And usually, this is along with other old platforms, and this is how an underwater artificial reef is built. There are now over 150 production platforms making up these underwater artificial reefs. While the presence of these new reefs provides habitat to many native species, the reefs also provide a home for invasive species. Lionfish and orange cut coral, which are invasive species, have moved into these new areas in the Gulf because of the new habitats formed by the artificial reefs. The orange cup coral is now the most commonly found coral species on many of the platforms. Next, let's talk about marine mammals. The Gulf of Mexico is home to 28 species of marine mammals. One is even an herbivore that inhabits coastal rivers, estuaries, bays, and near shore along coastal waters. This is the West Indian man manatee or it's also called the sea cow. This species is rarely seen in Texas, but it does frequent all the other Gulf Coast states. All other marine mammals in the Gulf are cetaceans. These are the whales and dolphins. The most common is the Atlantic bottlenose dolphin. They're often seen in Texas bays and estuaries. Other species include the Atlantic spotted dolphin, beak whales, spinner dolphins, and we even have killer whales in the Gulf. The biggest marine mammal in the Gulf is the sperm whale. It occurs primarily in mid-depth waters off the coast of Louisiana and Texas. Now, for reasons not well understood, whales and dolphins occasionally get stranded on land. While stranded, these animals sometimes are found to be ill or injured. 
but many times the animals appear to be perfectly healthy. Volunteers often try to help rescue stranded marine mammals. Now, increased education of the public, active management, and conservation efforts have helped ensure healthy populations of these species in the Gulf. Now let's talk about the sea turtles. There are seven species of sea turtles in the world. Five of these live in the Gulf. All have nested on Texas beaches, perhaps some in very large numbers historically. All of these species are now listed as threatened or endangered. Harvesting of the eggs for use by people, killing sea turtle adults for meat and for household products, and incidental capture in shrimp trawl nets were the biggest reasons the sea turtle populations dropped so low. Now, those activities were in the past. Today, no harvest of eggs or adult sea turtles is allowed, and special devices called turtle excluder devices are required on commercial fishing nets to help prevent harm to turtles. Recovery of sea turtles, however, is going to take many, many years. Efforts to protect nesting sea turtles on Texas sandy beaches help make sure that turtles are successful in laying eggs and hatching baby sea turtles. Texas inshore and nearshore Gulf of Mexico waters now provide important habitat for three sea turtles. The Kemp's Ridley sea turtle, green sea turtle, and loggerhead sea turtle. Special help is going to the Kemp's Ridley, which is the most endangered of all the sea turtles. This is also the smallest sea turtle in the world, weighing only about 100 pounds when fully grown. It tends to stay in shallow waters less than about 165 feet deep and prefers to eat crabs. But they'll also eat shrimp, clams, jellyfish, and tourniquets. As with all other sea turtles, the male Kemp's Ridley spends its entire life after hatching in the water, while the female only comes to a shore to nest. For the Kemp's Ridley, this takes place between April and mid-July. The female nests by crawling up the sandy beach to a point beyond the reach of the waves where it digs a large hole in the sand with her back flippers. There she lays about a hundred eggs, covers the eggs with sand, and immediately returns to the water and swims away. The whole process takes only about 45 minutes. The eggs hatch about 45 to 60 days later. At that point, the young crawl out of the sand and quickly move down the beach to escape from predators. Once they reach the water, they swim through the surf zone and into the gulf where they're largely carried away by the currents. It takes about 10 to 20 years for the sea turtle to reach maturity. Most of the breeding females nest at the same beach where they were hatched. Once they start nesting, most return to the exact same beach each time they are ready to lay their eggs. Because of this instinct, to return to the same beach, nesting areas are well known and are now protected. The primary nesting ground for the remaining population of Kemp's Ridley sea turtles is a 16-mile stretch of beach in Tamaulipas, Mexico. Biologists at the Padre Island National Seashore in Texas are now re-establishing and protecting a nesting beach on Padre Island. To do this, nests are located and eggs are placed in an incubation facility or a special beach enclosure to protect them from natural or human-caused threats. The eggs are then hatched, and when the young are ready to live, leave, they are released on Padre Island, and as they move down the beach, they're guarded from predators. They enter the surf zone, and they're carried away. Fish, 
and fisheries. The Gulf is a place of incredible biodiversity with over 1,500 species of fish calling it home. But it's the seafood that comes from the Gulf that many people know best. Commercial fisheries annually catch over 1.5 billion pounds of seafood. Shrimp and oysters are the predominant shellfish harvested in Texas. Catches in the Gulf account for 70% of all the shrimp and oysters that go into our grocery stores and restaurants across the United States. Recreational fishing is also important including catches of flounder, snapper, drum, sea trout, mackerel, shark, and tarpon. 45% of all the people who go fishing in salt water in the United States fish in the Gulf of Mexico.